to uh, the latest visual uh, virtual tour from uh, the depths of the Scottish Highlands. I'm uh, Andrew Baxter. I'm a professional uh, guide based here in the depths of uh, Scotland, not far from the little village of Glencoe. And I'm delighted to see so many people from across uh, the world joining me again this evening for our theme of Hidden Harbours. I can see people from the United States, some uh, old friends that have been uh, joining us for the last couple of weeks from uh, South Africa and lots of other places as well. You're all extremely uh, welcome. It's good to see you all. Now, before I get started uh, this evening, just point out some of the features if you're new here and uh, haven't been on one of these uh, virtual tools before. So uh, to uh, the right of your screen, that way even, um, is a, a chat bar. Feel free to introduce yourselves uh, in the chat bar uh, and uh, raise anything during the, uh, the session that might be unclear. And then right at the bottom of the screen is uh, a question uh, section as well. That's the best place to put questions because I can mark uh, when I've answered those uh, on the video recording and they will appear on the replay so you, uh, people can jump to the exact spot uh, within the recording that I answered that particular uh, question. Now, I know from some of the email correspondence that I've had since last week's tour, that there's been some speculation and comment about my choice of tipple uh, every Friday evening and what I might be enjoying this week. Uh, and even one guest suggested that if it wasn't whiskey on this occasion, whether I could send it to them. Well, I'm going to disappoint them, although I haven't gone with whiskey this week uh, and I'm going with a beer, I'm stockpiling my whiskey supplies in case our Prime Minister announces the lockdown going on even further uh, than we know at the moment. So my choice is a, another nice uh, a glass of beer. And for the benefit of uh, beer aficionados, this is from my own village. It's called uh, a River Leven Ales. I live in a small village called Kinloch Leven. And this particular beer is brewed in the village as it happens by a retired dentist. He gave up dentistry uh, and he went into brewing and eventually he opened his own brewery here in the village. So if you ever find yourself in and around uh, the Fort William area, keep an eye out for River Leven Ales. It's a local beer and extremely uh, tasty. So we'll get on with our uh, journey around uh, Scotland's coastline. For those of you that pre-registered, I hope that you found uh, the map that I provided uh, before this evening's session helpful. Uh, I know someone contacted me to say it would be really useful to have a map uh, with the places that you're visiting so that we know how they're spout and that we can follow up uh, and do a, uh, read a bit more or find out about a bit more about, about the places uh, that you visited. And of course, because we only have a, an hour together uh, each Friday, this is an, an, an in-depth tour that's not like being with me uh, in person uh, as I take guests around Scotland. We can only dip in and out of uh, different places. I hope it gives a flavour of uh, Scotland. Uh, bring back memories if you've been here before. And maybe motivate you to come here in the future or just enjoy it as an armchair uh, traveller. So tonight I've chosen 10 what I think are fantastic harbours. Some of them may be uh, quite well known. Certainly one of them I think will be known by many people. Others I think will be some hidden uh, secrets. And I've used the loosest definition of the word harbour as being a safe mooring or a safe anchorage. So it could be a natural uh, harbour or uh, a man-made structure. And I've got a combination of both types that I'm going to share with you this evening. So why did I choose the theme Hidden Harbours? Well, as a maritime nation, uh, Scotland's history and culture has been shaped 
by the sea. And we know from archaeological evidence that we as a country have been trading with places as far away as the Middle East and the Mediterranean for a couple of thousand years. So the sea has always been an important part of our everyday life. And then as history went on and Scotland became part of the United Kingdom, Scotland and the sea became very important in expanding our empire, not only in terms of building the ships that the uh, the British Navy needed to defend it or uh, our tradespeople needed in order to supply uh, the empire. It was an important part of Scottish life. And then we go through a, a much more sorrowful part of our history. The sea was important when many of our people uh, emigrated during a period known as the Highland Clearances and went across the oceans and settled in places like North America and Australia and New Zealand. And that's why we have so such strong Scottish links with countries like those to these days. And that brings us right up to today where the sea, although it's not so important in terms of the fishing industry for us, it certainly is in terms of of the energy industry, oil and gas, particularly out in the North Sea, but it's really important for tourism as well. Our harbours, our coastline, our lighthouses, our beaches attract tens of thousands of people every year, particularly in the Highlands, where I think some of them are the most stunning. And it seemed appropriate as this year was designated by the Scottish Tourist Board as being the year of coasts and waters that I spend an evening talking about our coastline and harbours in particular. So if you can just bear with me whilst I get my uh, photos uh, ready for you and get those up on screen. And we'll put on our, our uh, lifeboat, uh, life uh, jackets, just in case we fall overboard because the water can get a little bit choppy around the coastline of Scotland, and we're going to start off our, our journey. And the first place I've decided to visit, it looks rather tranquil uh, in uh, this particular photograph, uh, uh, and it is. It's, it's a lovely uh, sheltered uh, spot, uh, and this is uh, a little village called Crinan, and it's in the very end of the Crinan Canal, which is often described as the um, as Scotland's greatest shortcut, it a canal of only um, around about nine miles long, and it uh, stretches across from Loch Fine in the east across to the Sound of Jura in, in the west, uh, and it means, or and it was constructed, and still today means that uh, boats uh, don't have to take the much longer journey around the Mull of Kintyre and up the west coast. So it was built for convenience. It was built in the early uh, 1800s. And like uh, most British engineering uh, projects, uh, it was hopelessly over budget and it was extremely late in being finished. And indeed, they had to bring in a different engineer, probably Scotland's most famous engineer, a man called uh, Thomas uh, Talford. And we may come across him later on uh, during the tour, uh, they called upon him in order to make uh, things right with the project. And uh, the photo that we are looking at here is the canal basin. So the harbour, if you like, for the canal. And if you were to uh, be in the boat in front of us and turn it around towards that little, that little bridge that you can see, that will uh, swing open. It's a swing bridge and you can uh, sail through there into a lock gate. It's a, a sea lock and uh, eventually once the lock gates are, are opened and the water levels in the lock are, have evened up, uh, you are able to go out into the sea and travel along uh, the west coast. And in fact, before the advent of the railways, uh, particularly in the Highlands, the fastest route from the city of Glasgow to Inverness in the far north 
of uh, uh, Scotland was actually via the Crinan Canal because the route uh, overland was slow, it was torturous, it was dangerous, and this was the easiest uh, route. And uh, steamboats would uh, actually go from Glasgow all the way along uh, the Crinan Canal and up the west coast, stopping in at the different ports en route and heading out to the islands before heading up another canal, which we may talk about next week, the Caledonian Canal, to get to Inverness and out on the east coast of Scotland. And there's some interesting uh, boats in the foreground there. You can see the one called the Duke of Normandy uh, 2. That's a good example of uh, a barge, quite a wide, shallow-bottomed uh, boat. You would have seen these on the canals around Scotland uh, 100, 150 years ago. They were still being used. They would have been laden with things like coal and timber, uh, particularly a coal to take out to the, to the islands and the remote uh, west coast for heating and for fuel, and then bring back timber and fish uh, back to the cities. And then the little white uh, boat with the blue stripe around it, I, I, that's called the, the Vic 32, I think off the top of my head. That's being restored at the moment. You maybe see uh, the owner on board uh, the boat there. Now that's what's called a Clyde Puffer. And these were extremely popular uh, boats around the West Coast. They were uh, um, powered uh, by coal. That's why they were called a puffer, because of the black smoke and soot that would have come out of the, the chimney on board. And again, they were used uh, to supply uh, the islands and the more remoter areas of uh, the West Coast. Uh, the Crinan uh, village itself is a, a bit off the uh, uh, beaten track. It's uh, along a, a single track road from the main road. Not uh, surprisingly, as I think it's one of the prettiest places uh, in the West Coast, uh, it's never particularly overcrowded, uh, despite the fact that it has one of the best fish restaurants that you can find along the West Coast. If you look uh, behind uh, the more traditional white building with the chimneys in the at the edge of uh, the canal basin there, you'll see a more modern building uh, set back behind it. That's the Crinan uh, Hotel, extremely well known. Uh, for the quality of its uh, seafood, a really good place. And then too, you can look out uh, across the lock behind you, maybe across to uh, Duntroon Castle, which is the, the home of Clan Malcolm. And maybe you can listen out for uh, the pipes, the bagpipes that you may often hear uh, coming across uh, the water. There's no bagpiper there. It might be the ghost of a bagpiper from the early 1600s who uh, warned uh, the attackers on the castle uh, that he they had been spotted. And so the defenders, uh, seeing that their own piper had betrayed them, ordered his execution. And it said you know, that the ghost of the piper marches along uh, the ramparts of the castle to this very day. And you may catch a tune or two of his uh, floating uh, across uh, the water. So that's uh, the lovely Crinan uh, Basin. And if you head out through the, the sea lock uh, there, uh, we're going to head up the west coast to our, our next spot, a lot further uh, north to a place called uh, Easdale. And uh, this is... Uh, set on a, a series of islands called the Slate Islands, a little further south from the harbour town of Oban. And it's said that these islands roofed the world because what we're seeing right in front of us here is not actually really a harbour. The harbour's just round the corner from there. I think we get a, a, a shot of it in the, in the next photograph. But this was a slate quarry. It's hard to believe now it was flooded during a storm and eventually uh, abandoned. But uh, 
the uh, underneath this flooded pit is the remnants of a slate quarry going down dozens our, our feet worked by hundreds of men in, in the uh, islands here. And just over the water there, you can see the cliffs. And that's where the slate's been quarried out of the hillside uh, on the other side of the water uh, there as well. And in fact, there's two Easdales looking at each other across the water. So the village across the way there is actual Easdale Island uh, proper. And where we're standing, although it's called Easdown, is really uh, called El um, But somehow, lost in the mists of time, it's also known as Easdown. And the island we can see in the distance there is quite extraordinary. A really low population, probably about uh, 30 people, permanent residents, uh, live there today. But it has no cars. It has no roads. And it has no streetlights. And in fact, the most popular vehicle, if you can call it that, on the island of Easdale is the wheelbarrow. Because people use wheelbarrows to uh, to cart around their shopping from the, the little shop on the island when they're heading back uh, to their homes. And uh, the slate here, as I said, it uh, was used to, uh, to roof... Uh, the world. It was extremely popular. We know it's been quarried here since the 13th century. And if you ever end up in Glasgow, the slate on the roof of a Glasgow cathedral came from the quarries here in Easdale. And it used to be um, packed into boats as uh, ballast, particularly the emigrant ships that headed down to New Zealand. And I'm told that most of the old churches in the city of Dunedin in New Zealand are roofed with the slate here from Easdale that went out as ballast in those emigrant uh, ships. And uh, just one other little uh, tale for you before we head off from Easdale. Uh, there you are. That's a good view of the quarry there and gives it a, a bit of a scale there. That's my son, probably about four years old in that picture. And you're probably seeing, I don't know, one tenth of the quarry above the water line there. Uh, but it said a phrase that uh, we hear quite a lot came from Easdale because uh, the workers there in the quarries uh, when they went to the inn or the pub or they did their shopping, rather than handing across money, uh, what they owed was chalked up on a piece of slate from the quarry behind uh, the counter. And it said the phrase, put it on the slate, is uh, it came from e Easdale originally. And that practice used by the slate quarriers uh, themselves. So... Uh, Lots of links with this small, these small islands on the west coast with places all around uh, the world. We're going to head away from uh, the main coast of uh, the west, the main coast of mainland now, and we're going to head out across the sea. We're going to head out around uh, the Isle of Mull, one of the Inner Hebrides, past the Holy Island of Iona and we're going to go along the choppy uh, waters to, uh, you can't really call it an island, it's really just a lump of volcanic rock in the ocean, the Isle of Staffa and uh, oh before we do so uh, there's the harbour in Easdale itself with uh, the, the hill that's been carved out with the slates. I had forgotten that we uh, had that photograph and you can see it's not a particularly big place, only a scattering of houses on the island with uh, very few inhabitants left uh, these days. And we're heading across to the uh, Isle of Staffa and particular uh, Fingal's uh, Cave, possibly made famous by the composer Felix Mendelssohn, who visited here in 1829 and he, the journey and particularly the splendour of the island it gave him the inspiration for the Hebrides overture, often more, more often known as Fingal's Cave. And I always wonder 
why on earth he wrote such a magnificently beautiful, haunting piece of music when his journey from the mainland was absolutely appalling. They were delayed by at least a day trying to get here and he suffered the most horrendous scene sickness we are told in his diary as a result because the seas were so turbulent around the coast of Mull and Staffa itself and uh, you can't really call this a harbour it's really just a, a projection out from these uh, volcanic rocks here you can see there these are all hexagonal basalt columns uh, formed millions of years ago with these, these steps heading up onto the island. And if I can get a, a little video uh, open for you, it's just a short video that I want to show of the, the boat coming in to the uh, island. If we can get this up for you, taken last year. And this was uh, a particularly uh, benign day. It wasn't too a choppy where we were heading uh, along on that particular day. And the harbour, the steps that we just saw in the previous photos, just round the, the, the gap that we could see in uh, uh, between the, the, the island itself uh, and the little outcrop of rock. And then you find yourself uh, turfed out on to the quayside here and uh, to get to Fingal's Cave you've got to walk around the bottom of those cliffs, cliffs holding on to a, a steel rope uh, uh, to get to Fingal's Cave. There you are, you can see uh, the, the quite precipitous uh, path but it's well worth it and uh, Victorian uh, tourists, visitors used to actually uh, take the boat all the way into uh, the depths of the cave. It's far too choppy to be able to moor there. And a few years ago, actually, they had a boat with a, uh, not a full-size orchestra, a pared-down orchestra who actually played uh, Mendelssohn's Overture within Fingal's Cave itself. I think I've got a photo coming up there. So you can almost walk all the way into it. And you can see these columns of uh, a rock there. Really, really clear. And why is it called Fingal's Cave? Well, it said that this is the other end of a giant's causeway that led all the way across the Irish Sea. It was built by a giant from uh, Ulster, from Ireland, who wanted to go to war with uh, the Scottish giant, Fingal. And he built uh, this causeway, this giant's causeway across the Irish Sea and went into battle. And eventually the causeway was destroyed and it only leaves the very two ends of it. The giant's causeway in County Antrim in Ireland and Fingal's Cave or the Isle of Staffa here off the west coast of Scotland. So that's possibly maybe the most well-known place that we're going to head to uh, this evening. Um, we're going to head further up uh, around uh, the West Coast now to one of my uh, favourite places, uh, Shildig, it's called. And uh, Shildig, well, today, I, I think it's uh, possibly quite often... Um, bypassed. People go on um, this circular journey around the Highlands called the North Coast uh, 500 and they maybe zip past a shield egg because the, the main road is above uh, the village and the harbour and they're probably heading to a more well-known village called uh, Apple Cross and they're missing such an amazing treat. It's just virtually one line of houses whitewashed houses like the ones that you can see, a hotel and a couple of uh, fish bars. You can get the freshest seafood, prawns, longestein, uh, oysters, uh, mussels, crab, lobster, scallops, right from the quayside here and sit down on the harbour wall and look at the, the sun setting 
over the western horizon like we are in this particular uh, photograph. And it's a really remote area of the country called uh, Wester Ross. And it's a really interesting history as to why there's a village here at all. Because up until around about uh, around about 1800, there was probably just um, farm holdings, a scattering of um, small croft houses around this mountainous district. And then the British government decided that they needed a training area for their sailors. And they built a naval base, if you like, here to train sailors professionally to face Napoleon because Britain was still at war uh, with France and his Napoleonic uh, forces. And sailors were sent to this remote part of the United Kingdom for this, their training. And the government provided a hefty subsidy to encourage people to build here. Uh, and that's how uh, the village uh, grew. And then Napoleon was exiled to Alba and the government withdrew all the subsidies, the incentives to encourage people to, uh, to settle here. They no longer needed it as a training base and uh, things moved on. And uh, while well, they could have been down on, on their luck in uh, Schildig, but they made the best of it they uh, turned themselves and redeveloped themselves into a fishing village as well. And that would have been successful for a while whilst the herring uh, fisheries were off uh, the west coast of Scotland. But herring are quite fickle fish. Uh, they stay around for a couple of seasons and then they will disappear and they won't be seen for, for decades before reappearing again. And so uh, the boom times of the fishing uh, years also eventually declined. And today it's a rather uh, sleepy place. And for visitors in the know, it's the place to head uh, during the pleasant summer months when daylight in this part of Scotland will stretch through uh, to 11, almost midnight at the, the height of midsummer. And in fact, on a clear uh, summer's night like the one in this photograph, it never really gets dark uh, that fast and far north. There's always seems to be some form of light uh, in the sky. And uh, I thought I'd put in this photo just to give you some context. This would have been, this is an old a croft house above the harbour. Uh, traditional stone building, then lime washed in white. Uh, maybe originally it would have had a thatched roof, maybe made of uh, dried heather. And today, uh, a roof not with slate, not with thatch, but with corrugated iron came became particularly popular in the late 1800s and 1900s and uh, typically... Uh, of a style that you'll find on the islands and the west coast. And you can see the mountains uh, in the distance. So they're looking out towards the uh, Torridon uh, Mountains, particular uh, playground for walkers and mountaineers and some of the very oldest uh, mountains in the world. And we know that mountain chain disappears beneath the Atlantic and re-emerges on the other side in Canada because the rock types are uh, exactly the, the same either side of uh, the Atlantic. I'm just going to pause for a, a sip of water before we uh, head on. And this is where it's going to get a, a little bit uh, choppier and rougher if you were in a boat, because we're going to head right round the north coast of Scotland to uh, the Pentland Firth, one of the most dangerous uh, stretches, wildest stretches of water in the world. And two extremely strong tides a day surge through uh, the 27 kilometer length from the Atlantic to the North Sea and then back again. And uh, 
those uh, those tides make it a very treacherous passageway. And so lots of uh, ships uh, have been lost in that part of the world. And if you were a sailor a couple of hundreds of years ago, you may have uh, heard uh, tales of a fearsome uh, water beast that was long gone, but still very much in the mind of sailors. And that's the, the store worm, uh, which comes from uh, ancient Norse tales and still told today on the island of Orkney. And this was a, a giant, a gigantic sea dragon that used to emerge from the waters around the north of Scotland and the islands of Orkney and Shetland. And it would demolish uh, boats and drag down whole villages off the land into the sea. And it had absolutely to be destroyed. And many heroes came forward in order to defeat this fearsome beast and many heroes failed in their endeavours until a young farmer's boy eventually killed the dragon and he did so by sailing into the the jaws of the beast and flowing down its gullet into its stomach and there he set fire to his boat and eventually uh, the store worm was so full of pain that he spit the lad out. And as he did so, the lad whacked him the hardest blow possible on his head. It was so hard that it split the store worm into pieces. And his tongue went flinging off to the west, landing and breaking the land joined between Norway and Scotland and forming the sea that we know today as the North Sea. And one of his eyes went whizzing off to the west coast, and it went spinning and spinning and spinning round and round and round, and it formed this deep, treacherous uh, whirlpool that is now still there today, known as the Corrivrecken uh, whirlpool. And his uh, teeth fell out one by one and scattered hither and thither, forming islands and islets and skerries and forming the Western Isles of Harris and Lewis and Orkney and Shetland, the islands that make those up, those uh, archipelagos up as well. And what happened to his body? Well, that flew northwards and it landed in the icy Arctic Ocean where it froze solid and it lives below, we're told today, a thick layer of snow and ice. And occasionally the fire that still resides in the dragon bursts up from the sea and it formed uh, what we know today as the country of Iceland. So that's the legend of the store worm. And it would have been one of a whole number of stories and tales that the coastal communities, particularly in the Scottish Highlands, would have passed down from generation to generation over the centuries, and particularly amongst uh, the fisher folk. So if you ever find yourself on the little ferry that takes you across from John O'Groats, or near John O'Groats, across to the Orkney Isles, keep an eye out, just in case... Uh, the legend is true, and that young farmer's boy never really finished off the store worm, and he uh, lays in the depths of the Penton Firth, ready to strike the unwary once again. Now, ah, we're right round the top there. That's uh, not quite the Bent- Pentland Firth there. That's a more sheltered area. near. We're near the the main town in Caithness called Thurso, just a few miles down the road, a place called Castle Town, and its harbour is called Castle Hill. And thanks to Bridget Cameron for passing on this particular photo. I liked this because it was a, an unusual perspective from one of the old harbour buildings looking out across to the harbour there. Now, Bridget tells me uh, that she's uh, visited... Uh, the north of Scotland, Caithness, and for a very real reason that her son, I think it was, uh, married a local lass, and they live 
I think, in uh, Thurso itself uh, today. So we're, I don't know if Bridget's with us this evening, but uh, we're in the company of an expert and she'll be able to put me wrong if I get anything wrong about uh, Castle Hill. And uh, I've managed to dig out this, uh, this close-up photo of a rather forlorn looking stranded old uh, fishing uh, boat uh, there. But uh, what I really wanted was to you to see how the harbour has uh, been built. So uh, it's been built by uh, something called Caithness Flagstones. Can you see the layer of uh, perpendicular stone, uh, horizontal stones there? And then on the harbour wall beyond uh, the boat, they are perpendicular, they're vertical. Now, if you're to travel around uh, Caithness, not far from this, uh, and the farming communities, you'll notice that they don't have the stone walls that you see in many other places in Scotland, and they don't have fences, but they have slabs of stone uh, just plunged into the earth and lined up a bit like this along the uh, along the field edge. A bit like gravestones, but really close together. And they're using uh, this uh, Caithness flagstone, which is really strong, uh, really uh, durable. And uh, the it's been used to pave streets around the world. So Easdale roofed the world. You could say that Castle Hill, Castle Town and Caithness paved the world. So if you walk along many of the streets uh, in, uh, where are they, in uh, London, um, Sydney in Australia, Edinburgh uh, uh, as well, uh, there you will find areas that have Caithness stone set in their pavements. And uh, if you were to head around Wall Street in the financial district of New York, that is also made uh, from Caithness stone. And it was quarried locally and the first cargo left this harbour in uh, 1825. And uh, the boom time was there for about, about I don't know, about 100 years. By the 1920s, uh, concrete uh, was the more popular material. And our pavements were all of a sudden turned into not gold, but into uh, concrete instead. And if you did find yourself... Uh, right up in the, the far north of uh, Scotland, there's a, a, a heritage trail that you can follow around uh, Castle Hill and looking at many of the old harbour buildings. It describes what the buildings were used. There's an old mill there amongst many other things. So uh, uh, certainly a good day out, a good place to uh, wander and spend uh, a couple of hours. Now, you're in for a real treat next because this is possibly my most favorite place in the world. And when this virus lockdown is eventually lifted, I'm pretty sure that this is going to be the place that I head before I head anywhere else. So we're looping round, round the Pentlands Firth now, down the east coast of Scotland. Very different feel from the mountainous, a uh, craggy, uh, west coast the east coast is more flat plateaus with steep uh, high uh, sea cliffs and we're heading to this place Walago and to be precise uh, Walago steps and again thank you Bridget for providing this particular photo I love this one because I don't know this is maybe uh, three quarters of the way down you start from a grassy slope at the top uh, and head down uh, the slope, uh, down to the top of these steps. Something like, well, officially, the guidebooks say 330 steps from top to bottom. But I think the locals will say there's 360, 365. And when I last visited here with my children, I tried to get them to uh, count the number of steps on the way uh, way to the top, but I think they miscounted because they got nowhere near 365. I think they got 2,570 or something like that. And uh, 
you can see how steep this is from this photo is really uh, precipitous and uh, in fact uh, this is quite an inhospitable place it's a narrow inlet a uh, go which is the last part of the Walling go means inlet it's an old uh, Norse word and this and the Walling comes from the word whale and so this was once called the inlet of the whales and uh, if you were here 200 years ago uh, and if you were a woman in particular you would have been up and down these steps several times a day to service the fishing boats that were dragged up onto the rocks at uh, the bottom and you would have had wicker baskets you would have filled them with herring uh, at the bottom and then you would have put them on your back and climbed those 365 steps all the way uh, to the top where that fish would then go off to market uh, a few miles to the north to the main harbour town of Wick and that wasn't just the fish that the women had to carry up there it was the fishing nets as well if they couldn't be repaired down at the bottom they were carried all the way to the top so it must have been absolutely back-breaking work up and down those steps in gales and uh, storms and in all our weathers uh, a really 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 hard life and in this photo you get a a very different picture it's a, a far more benign blue skies uh, and I think the day that uh, we were last there, you wouldn't have been able to see beyond that headland that you can see on the right hand side. You can almost down to the bottom here and you might be able to see <clears throat> just on the right hand side of the picture there, just a small flat uh, grassy area called the Bink, about the size of uh, a tennis court. And that was the main service area for the harbour. You might just be able to see right on the edge, a little depression, a little round stone capped uh, place. Uh, that uh, was uh, where they would heat up uh, the tar. It's a barking kettle and they'd use the tar to waterproof uh, the nets, to preserve the nets for the harsh salt water. And they'd use that tar and slap it on to the keels of their boats as well to provide uh, protection. So all of that work went on down there. And at its very height, um, probably by the mid-1800s, Wallingo uh, probably had 20 boats uh, operating from this small harbour, mainly uh, fishing for herring, maybe some salmon, maybe whitefish, and also shellfish. Uh, and with the uh, advent of the railways um, in the 18, mid 1800s, late 1800s, it was an extremely busy harbour because all of a sudden at the very top of those steps, you had a railway line and it meant that you could get your produce even quicker uh, to market. And do you know, there was a fishing boat operating from Wanningo all the way up into the 1960s. That was when the last boat uh, departed and fishing no longer took part from this amazing place. Just going to move on, get a, a better idea of how treacherous the rocks are around this particular harbour, particularly down in the left-hand corner. You can see those scaries there, uh, and they would actually have been where the boats were dragged up onto those uh, those flatter rocks, but still a really a difficult job and and you had to be a really experienced sailor to be able to get into this particular harbour and we've just got one more uh, photo before we head on away from a while ago uh, and this is with my young family having a, a closer look at that barking kettle so you can see the the uh the sort of stone circle down into a pit it would have been heated from a furnace just behind us in this uh photo where they would have heated up the tar uh, used as that uh, preservative. So we're heading on down uh, the East Coast now for our next few uh, trips. And a, just a quick stop here 
at the lovely harbour of uh, Helmsdale that you can uh, see there just in the distance. Another one of these harbours built by uh, Thomas Talford, that great engineer that I mentioned right at the beginning of the tour. He earned the nickname Colossus of uh, the Colossus of Rhodes because he also not only built harbours, he built canals and he built roads and, and bridges. And there's about a thousand miles of roads that uh, are, he built and many of those uh, in the Highlands are still used today as, as well as the br original bridges that he built in the first half of the 18th, uh, the 1800s, the 19th century are still used by road traffic today. But the reason I stopped in Helmsdale wasn't because of Telford and his harbour. It's for the boats uh, that left here and, and during a period of really dreadful a part of Scotland's history when the landowners in this part of the country in particular decided that they could make more money from uh, sheep farming rather than the, the small tenant farmers that they had crisscrossed or dotted across their land and they removed their tenant farmers to the coast. They forcibly, in many cases, evicted them from their homes. Their accounts of how some watched their houses go up in flames as they were torched to prevent them from returning. They were moved to these coastal districts to gather seaweed, to, to gather kelp, and to uh, uh, just try and start to make a life in fishing, which was pretty difficult if your family had been farmers on the land for centuries before. And eventually, many of those men, women and children fell upon hard times and they either chose willingly to board ships in places like Helmsdale or they were forcibly put on them by their local landowners and those ships sailed across the oceans to a new world to a new way of life and above the harbour looking out to sea at Helmsdale is this statue the emigrants uh, statue a man with his family looking back to their homeland as they head away on those boats to uh, places like Canada and the United States. And that remembers the many thousands of people that left our country to make a new uh, life elsewhere as a result of the horrors of the Highland uh, clearances. And a very different statue uh, now from that uh, in Helmsdale. We have this rather buxom uh, lady, the mermaid of the north uh, on the seashore just below uh, the fishing village of Ballintor, just along uh, a couple of hundred yards uh, from the harbour. So I'm cheating a bit here because I haven't got a photo of the harbour, but... I wanted to you, you to show you uh, this uh, particular uh, statue, about 10 foot high. Originally, it was uh, made from bronzed wood and that was swept away uh, in a storm, I think in the year 2010, so about 10 years ago, and it was replaced by a, this bronze casting uh, a couple of years later, the Mermaid of the North, and she sits on the Clach Du, which is Gaelic, for the black rock. Uh, I should get a photo of the black rock here. And at high tide, uh, her flipper at the back there, her tail is submerged in the water. And as the as the tide recedes and you get to low tide, you her tail reappears. And mermaids, again, were one of these uh, legends of the really superstitious um, a fisherman. And uh, it's said that a local mermaid here was stolen by a local fisherman and made to be his wife. And to keep her, he hid her tail. And it was years after she had borne him many children that somehow by accident, she found her tail locked away in a heavy wooden chest. And she managed to escape back into the sea beyond Balintor 
And it's said that for many decades afterwards, she would be would turn every other day with fish to feed her hungry children who were neglected by the bad fishermen that had made her prisoner in the first place. So we're now heading down the east coast. We're on a place called the Murray Firth that stretches out into the North Sea uh, beyond us here. Firth is a, a good old Norse word, comes from the Viking word fjord, which really means a, a shallower, uh, a, sea, a flatter, broader a sea inlet, a bit like uh, the Norwegian fjords that you will see today. Um, we're heading across further down. We're a little further north of Inverness now on the coastline of a place called the Black Isle, which always confuses visitors because they expect to be going over a bridge or maybe a, a ferry to get to the uh, island, to get to the Black Isle. It's not an island at all. It's a peninsula. It's part of the mainland. No one's quite sure why it's called the Black Isle. Lots of uh, myths and legends probably lost in the mists of time. And uh, even though it's really only about 20 minutes from the centre of Inverness and some really interesting fishing villages and harbours around the Black Isle, it's a place that most people head straight past on the main road to the north of Scotland. And they're missing so much in this hidden part, like this village of Och. Uh, if you looked at the map, it's spelled A-V-O-C-H. You can see it on the slide there, but it's pronounced Och. And this is an ancient fishing village. And uh, I wanted to, you to see uh, how the village looked itself in these few photos that I have. And if you wander around there today, this is a photo that I uh, took uh, last summer. You will see that it's uh, an active fishing village and you've got the fishing creels for lobster and other shellfish heaped up on the, the shore side around the little huts and sheds that the local uh, fishermen are used. And this is a, a traditionally was a really close knit a community so close-knit that there are only three names ever in the village. Surnames. Patience, Jack and McLennan. And they had their own local dialect in the village. Today, you will still find that there is a surfeit of Patience's, Jack's and McLennan's and they use their local dialect still. And they use words like these and thou's which you probably will not hear anywhere else, a real uh, throwback to uh, other times here in uh, Och. Um, although it is still an active uh, sort of shellfish fishing community, it's quite diminished. And by and large, it's really a, just a dormitory commuter town uh, for the city of Inverness, which I said is probably only around about 20 minutes ago, just the other side of that a wooded hill that you could see in the distance. It's uh, beyond that uh, in the distance. So that's Och. Um, we're going to zoom down. We're round the other side of the Murray Firth over uh, the water. Not quite dead opposite from Och, but uh, a little uh, southeastwards from Och to uh, the last place on our journey tonight, which is the fishing village of uh, Burkhead. And uh, we know that there's been a community here for thousands of years. We know that there was an ancient fort here from at least the Iron Age, if not further back. It's another one of these Thomas Telford um, harbours built in 1807. Uh, this, many of the original buildings are still there. They've been turned into rather nice and expensive apartments now. Uh, those would have been originally the fishing a curing station and this place links all the way back to where we started at the Crinan Canal because the steamer service from Glasgow, the steamships in the 1800s traveled all the way from Glasgow along the Crinan Canal up the west coast along the Caledonian Canal to Inverness and then along the Murray Firth and they would stop in Burghead.
fan another fantastic place. And the reason I wanted to stop in this uh, glorious place is just in the last few minutes to introduce you to a particular tradition that's still carried out today. I've been talking about how fishermen uh, are quite superstitious and that goes back centuries, perhaps even to, to pagan times. And uh, the church authorities, first of all, the Catholic Church, and then the Protestant church over the centuries tried to uh, stump out many of these traditional beliefs. And um, this particular community, this strong knit fishing community uh, resisted this. And they still today practice one of their traditional beliefs, which dates back to probably pagan times. Now, you might not know this, but if you're in the Highlands, we have the ability to celebrate two new years each year the first of january and then if you're really lucky and up to it the 12th of january as well and that's the old scottish new year from the old julian calendar which was changed by the catholic uh, church and here in burkhead if you're here on the 12th of january and you're uh, out at night you will witness something called the burning of the clavi and i'm not sure quite sure how to explain this other than it involves a burning barrel of tar that is held aloft and carried through the streets up onto this high point above the harbour. And it's uh, ignited again and people go and try and grab a bit of the burning embers, which are said to be good luck. And they will light the first fire of the year in their homes as a result. And I'm not explaining it particularly well. And that's why I searched out a video for you to, to have a look at, which I'm going to get now. I hope this plays. If it doesn't, don't worry. I've included it in a, a follow-up link in your follow-up email that comes when the replay is available. This has got, it's a couple of minutes long, about three minutes long. It has subtitles which are written in the Scots language. Uh, but I think you will still get the the gist of what's happening. So let's see if we can get it up on screen for you to have a look at.
Well, there we are. Isn't that an extraordinary sight? The burning of the clavi in uh, a burghead. And uh, I thought I'd finish off with that uh, photo because of uh, that video, because if I had tried to describe it, you wouldn't have got the, the real benefit. And I'm always amazed that the health and safety police uh, that are so prevalent in Britain have, have failed to stamp out that particular tradition, uh, particularly when you see that guy throwing that paraffin on top of the burning clavy to, to ignite it again. I'm astonished uh, that this particular event uh, hasn't been bad, and I'm delighted that it hasn't because it dates back probably, as I said, uh, thousands of years to uh, pagan uh, times. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'm afraid that brings our time together uh, with our virtual tour to an end. It's been a delight uh, to be with you uh, yet again. I hope uh, you've in enjoyed yourself. Uh, a very big thank you to Bridget Cameron for her fantastic photos, particularly the one from Wellingo. Uh, and you are the winning of the photo prize this week. I'll be in touch to get your uh, address to send you a little gift. Uh, from Scotland as a thank you. I'm delighted to announce next week's uh, photo theme, which I've chosen is the Great Glen. So that's that huge gash from one side of the country to the other, stretching from Fort William in the west all the way up to Inverness uh, in the east, taking in Loch Ness on the way. I wonder if we will see the Loch Ness monster Nessie herself. Uh, next week. So that's next week's uh, theme. Before we go, and I say goodbye, just a few asks of you, if you don't mind. First of all, when you get the follow-up email with the replay, uh, if you're able to, do spend a, just a few moments uh, giving some feedback. You'll find a link there. Likewise, if you have a suggestion for a future theme, if there's a particular topic that you'd like me to cover or a place uh, that you would like me to visit, then please do get in touch. Drop me an email and I'll see if I can do it in future weeks. It looks as though the after effects of the pandemic will mean that we probably won't be traveling anytime soon. So I intend to carry on with our Friday night virtual tours for a little while yet. Likewise, if you can share uh, details of future tours uh, on social media, on Facebook or Twitter or whatever you like, or just an email to your friends and family, I'd very much appreciate that. Don't forget, in a few hours' time, once the replay video is ready, you'll get an automatic email. So if there's anything that you wanted to have a look at again or listen to or double-check, you'll be able to do that, and you can share that link with friends as well. If you have any questions, just uh, drop me an email. I'm going to double-check that there's none at the bottom here at the moment. There isn't. So that just leaves me to say... Stay safe, look after yourselves, and once again, I look forward to seeing you next week. Haste ye back. <laughs>